Hello, and thank you for joining today's service. We're gonna get started here in just a little bit, but before that happens, I wanted to give you some more things to chat about before service happens. So gather around your couch or your table or wherever you're meeting. Uh, if you have the ability to chat online in the chat box, please join the conversation there and we'll get started with our service very shortly. Hello, and thank you for joining today's service. We're gonna get started here in just a little bit, but before that happens, I wanted to give you some more things to chat about before service happens. So gather around your couch or your table or wherever you're meeting. Uh, if you have the ability to chat online in the chat box, please join the conversation there and we'll get started with our service very shortly.
Hello, and thank you for joining today's service. We're gonna get started here in just a little bit, but before that happens, I wanted to give you some more things to chat about before service happens. So gather around your couch or your table or wherever you're meeting. Uh, if you have the ability to chat online in the chat box, please join the conversation there and we'll get started with our service very shortly.
Well, hello again. Pastor Lenny is off this week and Pastor Ken is on vacation. And so I'm the lucky guy to be your one and only host here today. We have invited Pastor Todd Lester to share with us today, and he's going to be here in just a short little bit. But before we get there, we do have some information and news to share with you. So here we go. We wanted to inform you that we are continuing to observe the government stay at home order, which is set to expire on May the 6th. This means that from April the 18th until May the 2nd, our services will continue to be online only. We will continue to broadcast our services every Sunday at 10 a.m. And if there are any issues, if for whatever reason you can't connect, you'll be able to rewatch them anytime after on our YouTube channel. Along with keeping our Sunday morning services only online, we are also keeping all of our gatherings, our groups, and other ministries online for the time being. We know, trust me, we know that this is a very frustrating time for all of us. And we want to be very clear here. While we're not meeting in person in this room, uh, the church is not closed. We are happy to help and assist in any way that we can. So please do not hesitate. Don't feel ashamed. Uh, please reach out and contact us in any way to ask for help. We have people literally ready and willing to help out in any way that they can. If you're able and willing, please reach out to your friends, reach out to your small groups, reach across your friends to your neighbors. Well, don't reach and touch them, but use your voice and talk to your neighbors and, and pray. Pray for our church, pray for all the churches in our area, and pray for our government's leadership. Sable Christian Fellowship, stay tuned as we continue to assess the situation and provide updates as soon as we can to you. Thank you so much. Well, hello everybody. Welcome to our online church service here at Salva Christian Fellowship. My name is Andy. I'm one of the youth, I'm the, one of the youth pastors. I'm the youth pastor and the worship pastor here, and uh, it is my privilege and an honor, honestly, to uh, lead you in worship today. Um, allow me to give you a mini sermon, if I may. So, uh, I've been wanting to do this sort of idea for over a year, really. Just sit down behind a piano and lead you into worship through a digital platform. Now, uh, I know a lot of us, all of us, <laughs> most of us like to gather together in a room and, and sing together corporately and, and, uh, and, and so do I. But I think I, I, I watch a lot of worship um, videos online, live worship videos, and I think there's something special about being invited into that space that it's happening. Um, in a very honest moment, this is not fun, if I can say that for me, because I like to have a band to uh, hide into. I like to um, uh, kind of blend in with the rest of the team. Um, I don't like being in the spotlight. But over the last month or so, God has really just been challenging me and saying, you have a gift you need to share. And uh, a good friend of mine, um, encouraged and challenged me to, to, to really kind of do this and to, you know, he said, you make the piano sing and uh, thank you. Uh, I guess I do. I don't know. Honestly, I just, I wanted to sit behind a piano and worship. And as I do that, I wanted to share that with everybody, with, with you who are watching. So this morning, it's just going to be me and the piano and singing. And I really hope that you sing at home so you can drown out my mistakes. Hopefully my voice blends in a little bit with yours. This isn't a concert. This isn't a performance. This is a guy sitting behind a piano singing and worshiping and hoping and praying that you do as well. The other thing I wanted to point out was uh, clearly I'm dressed very comfortably <laughs> and uh, I'm hoping you're not judging that. I kind of did this for a purpose, and, and here's why. We read in the Gospels, Jesus teaching the Samaritan woman, he teaches his disciples, and really whoever's reading it, he's teaching this too, is that he says there will come a time that we'll be called to worship in spirit and in truth. The message isn't that 
the message is it doesn't matter where you go to worship as long as you worship in spirit and in truth. And so this morning we are not gathered in this room. We're gathered across the region, across the world. But it doesn't matter what you're wearing. It doesn't matter how you're sitting, where you're sitting in the house, uh, what you're watching on, how you're, who you're watching with. What matters right now in this moment is that you are positioning yourself emotionally and spiritually, even physically if you have to, in a way that is worshiping God. That you are worshiping in the spirit of God and all that that brings, the love and joy of Christ, the the forgiveness of Jesus, the, um, the, the, the redemption of sins, the, the spirit that is, is God, that we are worshiping through that. That we are able to put aside our differences and our frustrations and our emotions and our opinions and our our everything and just worship Jesus. That is what it means to worship in spirit. And worship in the truth of God, the truth that he loves us, that he's called us, that we are his. The truth that we have freedom from our sins. We, we don't have to feel guilty anymore about what we've done or what we haven't done. We don't have to feel shame for the mistakes of our past, the, the words that were spoken, the, the anger that has come out of us, the the bitterness, the, and the everything, we don't, we can just let that go through the name of Jesus. The truth that he has called us his own, whether we feel like it or not, there is truth in those words. And if we can put ourselves in a place where we are worshiping in the spirit of God, through the spirit of God, and in the truth of God, that is worship. And so this morning, today, whenever you're watching this, however you're watching this, may you find freedom to just worship. Together, worthy, all together, wonderful to me. 
chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Whom the sun sets free, oh, is free. I'm a child of God, yes I am, in my Father's house, there's a place for me, I'm a child of God, yes I am. Incredible words for us to be reminded of that we are His, we are accepted no matter what, no matter how many notes we play wrong on a piano in a song, no matter how imperfect we are in our daily lives, that we are chosen and we are His and we are accepted and we are free from the bondages that hold us down. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Save, sing it out. Well, you are the God that saves. You're the one who rescues me. You rescue me. You are the God that saves. And 
you call me from the grave you rescue me you rescue me you rescue me fails me and all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God sing that again I love you Lord I love you Lord Mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able And I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful and all my life I've been so, so good With every breath that I am able And I will sing of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after it's running after me Your goodness is running after it's running after me With my life laid down I'm surrendered faithful and 
And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able And I will sing of the goodness of God You know I love that song for a lot of different reasons. But here's the point that just kind of came to me is it doesn't say that I'm going to sing of the goodness of God when everything is going fantastic. It doesn't say I'm going to sing of the goodness of God when I'm incredibly blessed and filthy rich and I have everything that I've ever wanted. going to just sing of the goodness of God when I have everything that I need and want. The message to this song is that we're going to sing, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God every time, every moment, every day. In the frustrations and in the joys and the sadness and the pains and the celebratory moments and the confusing moments. And so that's my prayer is that in every day, every minute of our lives, no matter what is going on, and trust me, I know it's difficult in those really down, dark, frustrating moments. It's hard to worship. It's hard to find that joy and that peace. It's hard to be happy. But that's a choice that we have to make. That in those moments, no matter what, we're going to thank God for what He has blessed us. We're going to thank God that we can lean on Him in those moments. We're going to thank God and we're going to sing of this goodness of God that He's given us in him we have the hope in him we have the peace that everything's going to be taken care of we don't have the answers we don't know how we don't know why we don't know anything but we do know that he will provide he has provided he is providing and he will continue to provide Should come that they. 
words proclaim be shining through the message be heard across our region and across our world that it is through your son it is through the sacrifice paid it is through the redemption given that we have freedom freedom from sin freedom from shame freedom from guilt freedom from just being perfect or trying to be perfect. God, as we continue on this service, as we hear from the word, as we hear from Pastor Todd, God, may we continue to keep our hearts and our minds and our spirits open to you. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Good morning, Salva Church. It's good to share with you again, even in this virtual experience. Do you remember the joy you felt when you first came to know the Lord? That thrill when everything is new, everything is amazing, and God is working in your life in ways you never thought possible. Do you remember those moments when you first began to follow Jesus and how joyful it was? I was a pastor for 30 years, and I wondered many times, why is it that so many Christians lose their joy? I've seen so many people start off in the Christian life with excitement and enthusiasm. But as I watch them, after a while, they get a slow leak. You ever had a slow leak in your car tire? Over time, you watch it slowly go flat. I've watched people slowly go flat in their spiritual life. Their passion leaks, and when your passion leaks, so does your joy. And you end up kind of feeling kind of flat. I've had times in my own life when my passion and joy slowly leaked away. I don't think I'm the only one. Why does this happen? It's because there's certain things that can kill the joy in the Christian life. There are certain things that will intentionally rob you of your joy. And if you don't know what they are, and if you don't take proper precautions, 
You can easily lose the joy in the Christian life. You'll lose your joy as a Christian. I've seen it happen to many people. Today, I want to point out some things from the book of Philippians on how you can maintain your joy while you're living for the Lord. Obviously, joy is a recurring theme in the book of Philippians. The Apostle Paul says many times, rejoice and joy, be joyful. In fact, it's a great Bible study just to read through the book of Philippians and underline the word joy or a variation of that word. You'll find it all throughout the book. I want to begin reading in Philippians chapter 3 at verse 1. It says there, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Notice the word safeguard. I consider that to be an important word. It's a warning. It's Paul saying there's certain safeguards that will protect your joy in your Christian life. So you need to be aware of these killjoys that take the joy out of your life. I think Christians of all people have the most reason to be joyful, even in life's most stressful situations. I mean, you think about Paul. When Paul writes this, he's in prison. So from prison, he writes this epistle about joy. So you can say with certainty that Paul's not talking about the joy you get from your circumstances. Therefore, you can be laid off and still have your joy. You can be in a bad relationship and still have your joy. You can be in a bad financial state and still have your joy. You can be in a pandemic and still have your joy. Because what he's talking about obviously has nothing to do with your circumstances. In fact, I think Paul identifies three safeguards that will protect your joy when you live for the Lord. The first one I call this, be watchful for legalism. Why this warning about legalism? Well, legalism is a joy killer. It destroys joy in the Christian life more than anything else I've seen as a pastor. I've been a Christian for over 45 years now, and I've seen more believers ruined by legalism than anything else. It can ruin people. It can ruin families. It can ruin churches. Say, so, well, Todd, what is legalism? Legalism is su- a substituting rules and rituals for my relationship with God. And it's a subtle trap because it suddenly takes a focus off what God has done for you, and it solely puts your focus on what you're doing for God. God's legalism. When you get the focus off what God has done for me, that's grace. And you start focusing on what I'm doing for God, that's legalism. When you're first saved, the reason you have so much joy is you just love Jesus. You don't know all the rules. And you know everything you have is because of what Jesus has done for you. It's not what you're doing for him. Augustine once said, love God with all your heart and do what you please. Why would a theologian say that? Well, he believed if you love God with all your heart, you're not going to do something unpleasing to the Lord. You're not going to be interested in breaking his commandments. You know, you get saved, you're full of joy, you start serving the Lord, you're excited and you're enthusiastic, and along comes a legalist. Legalist says, now, to be a good Christian, you've got to do, and they have a list. But the problem is, every legal list has a different list. So you have this list, and that gets added to another list. And before you know it, you've got 459 ways to be a Christian. And you can't do it. You can't keep up with it. And you're overwhelmed. It's kind of depressing because the love you had gets replaced with all these rules you need to keep. It's not a new problem. In the New Testament times, they had this problem. There were a group of people called the Judaizers. In fact, you can consider them the original legalists. They were the people who came along who said, believe in Jesus as your Messiah, as your Lord and Savior. But you also have to keep these rules. The rules they were inter- interested in were the Jewish kosher rules, like circumcision, Sabbath, etc. They said, you got to keep all these Jewish rules in addition to serving Christ out of love. Well, Paul, he couldn't stand the Judaizers. That's why they tried to get Paul killed. And he doesn't mince his words in these verses that we're going to read. He's not... He's not being very polite. He's not being very Canadian. And he's certainly not being politically correct. But this is what we read in Philippians 3, beginning in verse 2. 
Paul says, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. Do you see his anger? He says, watch out for those dogs. I have a dog, Stella. I know you probably think your dog is cute, but you've not seen Stella. But Paul, he's not talking about cute, cuddly pets. It's, in fact, in the time, the context, it was about the worst thing you could call a Jew is to call somebody a dog. Because in those times, dogs weren't pets. They were, um, they were dangerous. They were wild scavengers. So anytime you see a sign, beware of dogs, it's biblical. Paul goes on to say, for it is we who are the circumcision. Because they were saying you had to get circumcised to be saved. But Paul says, it is we who are the circumcision. We who serve God by his spirit who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Paul calls them dogs because they were telling people you have to be circumcised to be saved. They're pulling people into legalism. So the first safeguard is this. If you want to keep your joy, live each day by grace. Grace is the key to joy. Grace simply means I don't have to earn God's love. I don't have to earn God's approval. I don't have to earn a pat on the back from God. God is always in love with me. Because I deserve it? Not a chance. Because I keep certain rules and regulations? Not a chance. Why is God always in love with me? Because I'm redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's grace. You know, I can't make God stop loving me because I didn't make him love me by something I did. I just accepted what Christ did for me. Someone once said that every religion in the world except Christianity can be described with one word. It's the word do. Do this and do that and do the other thing. And if you do enough good things, then you'll tip the scales in your favor and you'll receive your eternal bliss. Christianity, unlike every other religion, is not described by the word do. It's described by the word done. It's what Christ has done for you. Not what you do for him. It's what he has done for you. The problem is uh, you're a Christian long, over a long period of time. You start showing God. You subtly start shifting from that perspective to the perspective of this is what I'm doing for God. As if I'm earning God's approval by my lifestyle. You know, God won't love you anymore whether you serve him or not. What you get out of service is joy. What you get out of service is reward in heaven. You can get approval from God. God approves of you, not because of what you do. He approves of you because of what Christ has done for you. That's grace. Here in the text, Paul illustrates from his former life. And he says... I know about legalism. He says in verses 3 and 4, Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. He says, if you want to be a legalist, I was a superstar legalist. Nobody's going to talk me when it comes to keeping the law. In fact, if you read through the passage in verses 5 and 6, Paul gives all these examples of his legalistic lifestyle. You know, he talks about his rituals. Paul says, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. He talks about his race. Paul says, of the people of Israel, I was of the tribe of Benjamin. He talks about his religion. Paul says, I was a real Hebrew if there ever was one. He talks about his rules. Paul says, I was a member of the Pharisees. So the Pharisees were, they were the spiritually elite. You can think of them kind of like the green berets of Judaism. So they took the Ten Commandments and they added 613 more commandments. They took the Ten and expanded them into 613 more commandments. For example, they would not eat an egg that had been laid on the Sabbath because that was considered work by the hen. They would not scratch a mosquito bite on the Sabbath because that was considered work. They believed a person couldn't look in the mirror on the Sabbath and pull out a gray hair because that was considered work. We're talking picky. Paul says, 
You want to talk about rules? I know rules. Kind of interesting that last year I was in Israel just before the pandemic started. I was in Israel and I stayed at a hotel.、Uh, one hotel I stayed at had 15 stories. I went out on the Sabbath morning. I didn't realize it was Sabbath, and on the Sabbath, the elevator automatically stops at every floor. Why? Because the、uh, the religious fundamentalists believe you shouldn't push a button. That would be work. So the elevator automatically stops at every floor, so you don't have to push the button to stop at your floor. I found that very annoying. Paul talks about his reputation. Paul says. I obeyed the law without fault. You know, Paul said, "I was a superstar legalist." Whatever you, what, whatever you're going to say about obeying God, Paul says, "Been there, done that." Here is what I think he's talking about: good things done for the wrong reason. Nothing wrong with those things. The problem is when you start thinking they give you points with God, and they don't. That's true for all of our religious activity. If you do those things for the wrong reason, it'll take the joy out of your Christian life. Because God loves you unconditionally. If you start trusting in all your religious activity, you're gonna lose your joy. Paul said elsewhere in Romans fourteen seventeen, "For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness." Of peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. There are two threats to keeping your joy in terms of your theology. One is legalism. Paul talks about that. As I've tried to explain. The other is liberalism. So liberalism can be summed up. It's the idea that you you can't trust the Bible. You know, today people are taught to doubt their beliefs and believe their doubts. That doesn't make any sense. Leave your beliefs and doubt your doubts. I've noticed as a pastor that many people are worked up and concerned about liberalism as they should be, but I didn't see many people paying attention to legalism because it's equally destructive. Number two, I say it this way: beware of all distractions. Beware of all distractions. Beware of all the. Second-rate options. We live in a time unlike any other in the history of humanity that offers more distractions than ever before. Paul says in verses seven and eight, "But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage." That I might gain Christ. This is Paul's P and L statement. This is Paul's profit and loss statement. If you run a business, own a business, you know what a P and L statement is—a profit and loss statement. And Paul says, "Whatever was profit, I now consider loss. Whatever was valuable to me, I now consider worthless. It's a loss compared to the greatness in knowing Christ." For whose sake I've lost all things. So Paul says, all those things I've just listed, all those things I was so proud of, they're worth zip. They all add up to one big zero. The NIV translation says, "I considered all garbage." The translators here are being polite. The the Greek word garbage isn't the best translation, as the Old King James Version notes. The word could be translated very well. Dung or manure, animal excrement, however you would say it. He's saying all those things I consider important. He says they're just dung. He's saying he's saying it's he's not saying it's garbage. It's worse than garbage. All that that stuff I count important is dog crap. He's not mincing words here. He doesn't want you to lose your joy. I thought I don't look at it that way. I don't go home at night look at my house and go, yeah, that house just dog crap. Or my TV, or my car, or my sports. I don't go. Yeah, my stuff is just dog crap. Paul says, compared to knowing Christ, all that stuff is worthless. So this is the second safeguard to your faith. Don't get distracted. Don't lose your joy over things that aren't important. 
I once read a book called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, and it's all small stuff. A lot of things can cause you to lose your joy in the Christian life. People don't, they don't do what you want them to do. They don't show up when you want them to show up. They let you down. All kinds of different things happen. But what Paul's saying here is what matters is not your pedigree or your prestige or your position or your possessions. You can have all that and still be unhappy. Jesus said this way in Luke 12, 15. He said, watch out. Be on your guard. Safeguard yourself. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Jesus is saying the same thing Paul saying. All those things you thought were profit, they're just loss. All those things you think are cool, they don't really matter that much. If you want joy in your Christian life, you have to make a choice here. Because you can't live for two things at one time. You know, Jesus said it in this way. He said, no man can serve two masters. You've got to decide. I mean, the second greatest reason why people don't join the Christian life is why they get the slow leak. The first is legalism, but the second is distractions. And they're to work up or fool what they have to give up in order to live for Christ. So I don't want to beat around the bush today. When you come to Christ, you you give up everything you've got. But then you've never had it so good. Because he takes what you've given to him and he he reforms it and he reshapes it and he adds new meaning to it and he gives it back to you in a new way. Jim Elliot was a famous missionary. He was martyred by the indigenous people of Ecuador said, he is no fool to give up that which he cannot keep for that which he cannot lose. The third reason you lose your joy, I say it this way, you have to be willing to grow through suffering. You must be willing to grow through suffering. There's no way I can make this easy to digest or secret sensitive. If growing happens, we're going through tough times. Paul says it this way in verse 10. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Let me ask you, how well do you know Christ? I mean, there's a big difference between knowing about someone and knowing someone. Like, I know about Taylor Swift because I raised two daughters, so I know more about her than I would care to know. But I don't know Taylor Swift. I only know about her. Do you know Jesus? Not know about him. More than that, know him. Because this is the third safeguard to maintaining your joy. You have to develop intimacy with Christ. Even when it means growing deeper through suffering. I remember hearing a story about a little boy fell out of bed. His mother came in and said, what happened, Tommy? He said, I guess I stayed too near where I got in. That's a problem with a lot of Christians. They get in the family, but they stay too near where they got in. They don't go any deeper. They haven't grown in knowing God. That's why their joy is faded. God allows all kinds of problems in your life. And so that he can demonstrate his faithfulness, his dependability. Unfortunately, we don't grow much in life's good times. We grow and learn to depend on God in life's hard times. Paul says, I want to know Christ. He said, well, doesn't he know Christ? Of course he does. But he wants to know him better in a deeper way. He never stayed hungry for God, even when it meant suffering for Christ. Friends, this is how a man suffering from infirmities in a cold, dark dungeon of a prison near the end of his life can write a book about joy. Let us pray. Father, I know that you want each of us to experience real joy. I pray each person would just take account of where they're at this morning if they feel that their joy has faded, that it's not what it used to be, what it once was. I pray that in these moments as we pause, 
and then listen to your word and now pray in conclusion that each who listens to my voice would would reflect and say which of these three three things have happened in their life have they been given to legalism and lost sight of grace have they been distracted we live in a world with so many distractions or have they been afraid to know you in a deeper way and suffer for your cause we want to speak to each of us pray open our heart and let your spirit work in us we pray in Jesus name amen Thank you so much for taking time and joining us today. Pastor Todd, thank you for sharing and speaking today as well. If you have any questions, we are ready to chat with you. Reach out to uh, reach out to us through any of our social media outlets. You can even email us at info@sobelchurch.ca. You can call the church office and we'll be in touch with you as soon as we can. If you have any prayer requests, we'd love to pray with you. Simply go to the link on the screen and fill out our online prayer card. Have a incredibly blessed Sunday. Our hope and our prayer is that you will feel and know the peace of God, especially in these frustrating times. We'll see you again next week online. Have a great day.